Let's run through all of the weapons that the Vikings used and some of the weapons that they didn't. Hey folks, Matt Eaton here of Scholar Gladiatory. Now, those of you who watch the channel regularly will have a pretty damn good idea of um, weapons that Vikings used during the Viking Age, and I'll clarify that point in a second. Uh, if you watch this channel regularly, you'll probably have a good idea, but I don't think I've ever run through all of the weapons that Vikings commonly used during this era, and equally mention some of those that they didn't use, but which do appear in the hands of Vikings in TV, movies, um, video games, things like this. And obviously in the course of the this video we're going to be looking at Viking swords, Viking spears, Viking axes, certain types of knives, um, some other things as well. What we're not going to be talking about particularly are shields and armour. We're going to be looking mostly at weapons of offence. Uh, just for those of you who are interested, Viking shields, generally speaking, were usually uh, bigger than this um, somewhat, uh, maybe, maybe by an extra kind of uh, 10 or 20 centimetres in some cases. They were usually round and they are gripped in the centre by a boss um, with a grip in there and the steel or iron boss protects the hand. Towards the end of the Viking era we do get certain types of kite shield come in, famously uh, featured on the Bayer tapestry in the hands of Normans, but we do find oblong and kite shields coming in right at the end of the Viking era, but for most of the Viking era round flat shields uh, were the way possibly some domed or uh, lenticular shields as well to some extent which I've done some videos on. But in this video we're going to be primarily looking at weapons of offence. But before I go on, my channel comes to you largely thanks to sponsored videos, and this is one of those. Um, so I want to go over to our sponsors, who are, for this video, Raid Shadow Legends. And you guys know all about Raid Shadow Legends already. It's the hugely popular mobile or PC-based, turn-based fantasy combat game. Awesome fancy characters, loads of weapons, millions of players, and you can take the game anywhere with you in your pocket. Use my free links below this video in the description to download Raid to your mobile phone or PC. What I like most about Raid is thinking about the tactics to try and defeat other players in the person versus person arena. I also like summoning new characters and then using those characters to level up my favourite characters. I also like going into the dungeons and trying to improve my times and winning new rewards to help advance my characters. So I'm getting ready for Christmas here, I hope you are too as well. I'm here with my friends Nicholas, Rhinebeast and Frostbringer. Christmas is coming in Raid Shadow Legends as well. What's new in Raid? Well this month Raid just released their biggest ever update. The main event here is the Doom Tower. It's a giant tower with 120 floors, a bunch of secret challenge rooms, and 12 seriously badass bosses to take on. They're also releasing 14 awesome new champions just in time for the holidays, along with a whole host of holiday events and tournaments. There's really never been a better time to start playing, and here's the best part. The raid team are giving away a bunch of free new goodies, plus a super special champion to get everyone started in the tower, Bulwark. He's absolutely awesome in clan boss, and he's also going to be huge help in the tower against those bosses. So if you're new to raid and you want to get a head start, then click on the link below. And if you're a new player, you'll get your free Void Champion Bulwark, 50 gems, an XP booster, some energy refills, and even an ancient shard as soon as you get into the game. You'll see that the Bastion now has a funky snowy Christmas look, and all of this treasure will be waiting for you up here in the inbox, which looks like a little treasure chest up there. These awesome rewards are only for new players and only for the next 30 days. You'll find me in game under the name Captain Context, of course, and if you're quick enough, you can even join my clan. So what are you waiting for? Go and click the description in the link below now. So thanks for sticking with us, now back to the main content of this video, which is looking at the weapons which were popular, predominant during the Viking era and used by Vikings. Now, just to caveat that point, there were of course other weapons in use around the world by other peoples, other cultures, but what we're looking at here are really weapons um, of the Viking Age that were actually used by Vikings uh, by and large. Now I am going to mention a few possible exceptions and possible caveats, but these are the weapons that they predominantly used. So first up to mention are, of course, swords. And these are the weapons that a lot of people, obviously it's the type of weapon which gets the most attention, it's the most glamorous, it's the most high status. 
Swords were very, very important to them apparently, and we gather this from uh, the importance that they played in um, uh, grave burials, uh, also the fact that swords were very clearly uh, taken and given, uh, both as signs of conquest, also of loyalty and of fealty. They had an important place to play in society. But a very important point to make is that what I'm here holding here is that a Viking sword. Technically, obviously, it's a modern replica, but it's a modern replica of a sword found in Ireland. And you might famously know that um, Ireland was um, invaded by the, and settled by the um, Scandinavian invaders known, known as the Vikings. Um, Dublin, famously um, kind of built up by, by Viking activity. But this particular sword that it's modelled on is almost certainly Frankish. And that is one important elephant in the room that we have to mention when we're talking about Viking swords, is what lots of people refer to as Viking swords aren't in fact Viking swords. They're not even Scandinavian swords. Many of them are actually from other parts of Europe. They might be from England, they might be from what's now called France or Germany, uh, so the Frankish Empire, um, or a wider field in fact. But most of them in this period, most of the blades seem to have been made in the Frankish um, Empire and some were being made in England as well. And indeed some were made in Scandinavia. So I don't want you to go away from this thinking that, oh, uh, Matt, Matt Easton says that the Scandinavians didn't have their own swords not true. So there is a typology, Peterson's typology, and there's been work done since by people like Ian Pierce uh, in Swords of the Viking Age. And if you look into this um, area of study, you'll find that a lot of so-called Viking swords aren't Viking, but some of them are from Scandinavia. Okay, so if you look at, um, and I'll talk about the sources for what we study here in a second, but if you look at um, Viking age swords from Scandinavia, you will find both local designed um, hilts and you will find English styles and you will find specific Norwegian styles as opposed to um, Sweden and Denmark. And additionally, you will find Frankish styles from parts of what's now France and Germany. So the fact is that there was a lot of um, movement of swords going around because they were expensive, high status items that are hard to make and were heirlooms. If you look at things like the Icelandic sagas, which are later, but they're talking about certainly the culture which uh, interlinks very strongly with Viking culture. Um, and it's talking about earlier periods as well. Um, it's very clear that swords play an important part in, uh, in status, but in um, passing down as heirlooms within a family as well. There's a lot of emotion attached to swords, just as there is today, and why it's fed through into fantasy and sci-fi, things like Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and everything else. So, Viking era swords. So now, we've discussed the fact that Viking era swords break down into Scandinavian types, Frankish types, English types, and any of these could have been used by Vikings. We demonstrably know that there were English swords taken probably as booty or conquest to Norway. Uh, we know that there were the Frankish swords taken to um, uh, taken to parts of Scandinavia, but equally we find Scandinavian types of swords in continental Europe as well, perhaps given or won in battle, because remember the Vikings didn't win all their battles. In fact, if you go through the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, I seem to remember roughly it's about 50-50, fighting between the English and the, the Vikings, sometimes one side won, sometimes the other side won. So swords could go, and all weapons and armour and equipment could go in both directions. Um, and But we do find some graves, some burials of Vikings who were buried in the pagan um, Viking way in continental Europe and England, which have Scandinavian objects in them that are Scandinavian made. Now, most swords of this era have this type of blade that you see here. I'm going to talk about a slightly different type of sword in a second, but it does nevertheless have a similar blade. They are broad, fairly um, unpointy. Well, they're, they're pointy, but they're not narrowing at the point like later medieval swords, or indeed some swords from other parts of the world at this time. Um, but they are fairly broad cutting swords with a central fuller down the center of the blade. The fuller isn't universal, but it is very, very common and it is normal. In Oakshot's typology, this type of blade would be called a Type 10. We do start to get slightly later types come in at the end of the Viking era, but again, I'll talk about that in a second. And for the most part, um, hilts at this point uh, in time in this part of Europe, in the Viking Age and used by Vikings, have a shape that looks a bit like a capital I. Okay, The pommels can take various forms of shape and 
type of construction and the cross guard that uh, can take various forms again but it can be longer or shorter but it's usually quite short certainly short compared to later medieval swords and again I'll talk about that in a second. They are not especially long but they're not short either they usually vary I'll use inches here because that's what I'm most familiar with as a Brit um, but the, the blades usually vary between about 27 inch blade up to about a 30 31 inch blade so they're not short uh, and they're fairly long for the period um, they're longer than a Roman gladius but they're shorter than um, a lot of later medieval swords um, but they are broad and they are balanced fairly quite often they're balanced fairly far from the hand so they are light swords they're usually only about 800 to 1000 grams uh, but they have a lot of authority in the cut because the point of balance is far from the hand and remember that they are not designed to be used by themselves as they often are in movies they're not used like a later military saber for parrying and and all of this kind of stuff saber play they are used predominantly with a shield yes sometimes someone might have broken their shield or dropped their shield or lost their shield or been disarmed of their shield and have to use a sword by themselves but that's not what they're intended to be used for they're intended to be used with a shield and that's true of most weapons of this era and certainly this part of europe so most of these double-edged straight swords are of this general form and they differ more or less overall if we're taking a big picture view they differ mostly in detail but there were some other types of swords around at this time and um, one of those types of swords is a single-edged version of this so particularly in Norway uh, we find that single-edged blades which um, have a hatchet point essentially and have a they're a back sword essentially they have a, a, a blunt spine along the back and the fuller is located towards the back towards that spine sometimes you get unfullered blades and um, flat or lenticular blades but usually they're fullered so you do sometimes get single-edged blades why might you get single-edged blades well it may have just been that they were easier to make um, we don't really know um, but it was a style that was popular particularly in what's now Norway um, and but you do find them elsewhere sometimes so you do sometimes get single-edged versions of these swords now as mentioned towards the later part of the Viking era into what in certainly in England we'd know as the Norman era um, you do start to get slight changes in sword types and shield types and there's also seems to be more armor being worn there seems to be that armor is more um, common and also of course in areas uh, certainly influenced by the Normans there's a greater use of cavalry so for example the use of horses comes into England uh, more predominantly obviously after the Norman conquest um, so there are many possible reasons for why this started to change but one of these changes that starts to happen already in the 10th century is the elongation of the guard here and um, forming of pommels into shapes that start to look a little bit more like later medieval swords but that's a topic for another video this is really at the end of the Viking Age that we start to see these long usually quite um, spiky shaped actually long guards why did these long guards come in that's a great topic for another video we'll discuss it at another time we also start to see a general lengthening of blades and a tapering of blades um, so already in the 900s um, from about 950 we start to see that certain blades are broader at the base here than they are down at the even at the cutting portion of the blade here and they taper down and they become a bit more pointy so there was a general trend away from these broad fat spatulate tipped chopping uh, style blades to slightly more tapered blades balanced a little bit closer to the hand and then a gradual elongation of the guard so this is a gradual evolution towards the later medieval sword and this is accompanied by new types of shield which start to come in as well so we've probably talked enough about swords obviously that's just an overview Peterson's typology is the place to look for Viking era swords and anyone who's really interested in this topic I highly recommend that you get Ian Pierce's book and I'll put a link to that uh, below in the description now the next most important weapon that actually you could say is the most important weapon and certainly in most videos I would have put this weapon first can you guess what it is that's right it's the obvious spear the beloved and uh, omnipresent spear so the weapon that's the most important hand weapon really from the ancient period through the medieval period you could say into the renaissance as well really um, in the form of the pike the spear okay now the spear came in various forms now as you can see this is quite difficult for me to maneuver in here and that 
illustrates quite, for example, I can't put it straight upwards because it hit the ceiling, uh, but that illustrates quite nicely, I think, for the purposes of this video, why I didn't put this first. And that is because we're talking about the Vikings. Now, Viking activity obviously has various forms and invading armies like the Great Horde of 865 um, or, you know, Canute's army, we would describe as uh, potentially would describe as a Viking army, and that is an organized invasion force, you know, Harold Hardrada's army. We describe them as, uh, as a Viking army rather than a Scandinavian army, although we should probably apply the latter because he was after the throne of England. So the problem is, is how we define Viking. But to my mindset, the way we talk about Vikings implies that they are, certainly in the earlier stages, they are raiders. Now, if you're attacking and raiding, if you're raiding monasteries or attacking towns, spears might not be the most useful weapon to have around. So I, on this channel, you know, I try and big up the spear uh, because I'm trying to redress this balance and bring back a degree of credit to spears, which they deserve. The fact is they were the most important weapon on the battlefield for a long, long time together with bows. But when you're raiding and when you're doing this quick hit and run kind of stuff that certainly in the earlier Viking period was a very major um, factor behind what was a Viking, what, what, what are we talking about when we say Viking, that was it. And when you're doing that type of activity, often shorter weapons and lighter weapons being more lightly armoured perhaps even as well, this is being conjectured, um, are more appropriate. So sword and shield, uh, Saxon shield, um, axe and shield, things like this were probably or possibly, there's some evidence to suggest, they were more common in this type of raiding activity than necessarily spears were. Spears are something more of a battlefield and of an organised uh, or rather a, a large coordinated force rather than a raiding party. Raiding parties more likely to use lighter, shorter weapons a lot of time, especially if you're going to buildings. Um, or built up areas, um, if you're going into monasteries, imagine trying to run around and rampage in a monastery with a great long spear, not very easy. Really easier to do with a sword or a knife in your hand. But what types of spears did the Vikings use? Well, we can essentially split three spears, in my mindset, into three different types. There is a conventional long thrusting spear, there is a lighter throwing spear, and bear in mind you could throw anything. You can throw an axe, you can throw a mace, you can throw a shield if you're Captain America or a Viking. Um, you can throw anything, but there are some spears which are very clearly optimised for throwing. And lastly, there is a type of spear which is quite um, unusual in this period, but which starts to get some exposure and is mentioned in the Icelandic sagas as well. And that is the so-called hewing spear or the spear which has an ability to cut, which is the one of the first appearances really in the medieval period of a, what I would call a complex pole arm. And I'll get into that in a second. So first up, typical thrusting spears. Well, even they split down into different types. You'll notice that this type here, uh, made by Paul Binns, this is a type of, a shape of spearhead which was around uh, in the Anglo-Saxon Frankish uh, Viking era, and you'll notice it has a leaf or lozenge, lozenge shape. Now there were some spears which were a lot more angular than this, and indeed there is some difference uh, between spear shapes in different areas. You don't find the same um, cross-section of types in uh, Frankish what's now France, as you do necessarily in uh, England at the same time, as you would do in Norway at the same time. So there were different preferences in different places for different types of spearhead, but generally speaking, whether it's a long and angular head or a long and leaf shaped head or a short and angular head or a short and leaf shaped head, there were many types of spearhead preferred by different people, but many of these were essentially thrusting spears to be used predominantly as a hand weapon, either over or under, okay? Uh, used, of course, with a shield, with a boss gripped round shield. Um, and these spears could come in different lengths. Uh, we, there's a lot of debate about spear length because what do we have to go on? Well, so I mentioned earlier about swords and I'm now gonna expand a little bit into where our evidence comes from for what I'm saying in this video. So there are essentially three places. Number one, is written source material. Now written source material is a little bit difficult for the, the Vikings uh, because the Scandinavians weren't writing down an awful lot in this period and a lot of um, source written source material that we talk about for Vikings like the Icelandic
Icelandic sagas are actually later in period, but they're later in period talking about earlier periods. But there's a degree of uncertainty, therefore, in interpreting them and whether they were correct or not, or just making stuff up. Um, so written material. Second is art. Okay, so sometimes these weapons and equipment is shown in uh, carvings or um, uh, manuscript illuminations from, uh, from France and England at the time. And thirdly, archaeology. And archaeology splits down into a few different types, but essentially it's the weapons uh, that have either come from a uh, in situ, kind of in a grave, for example, so they're buried with a with a warrior who's died and they've had all their weapons put in them with, with them, or they're a, uh, an, a un, <laughs> not in situ, essentially, a weapon that comes out of something like a river, okay? And river-found weapons are actually very numerous because throughout human history, going all the way back to the Bronze Age, for some reason, humans think it's a good idea to throw weapons into rivers as some kind of offering to the gods or to God or to whatever, um, the spirits. Um, and uh, rivers, river banks, can become uh, good environments for preserving metal if there is a low enough oxygen. So within the clay of the sides of rivers, you sometimes get very low oxygen. If you don't have oxygen, it can't corrode so much, and so you get good preservation. So that's the three ways we get these weapons preserved to us and why we know what we're talking about to some extent. But there's still lots of guesswork, there's still lots of unknowns. So back to spears. So we've got thrusting spears of various sorts and various lengths and as I mentioned the length of spear shafts is something we can only really guess at based on uh, artwork and uh, written text to some degree and archaeology but in archaeology it's difficult because the wood of the shafts doesn't survive, uh, it rots away. Uh, you can look at grave length but then you've got the issue of were the spears shortened to fit in the grave um, which is probably quite likely. But we can conjecture based on what source of material we do have uh, and looking at artwork when people are illustrated with spears and you can see where the spearhead is in the common mind of a manuscript illuminator of the 9th or 10th century, um, you can see that spears probably varied from usually about the same height as a, as a human, um, so you know five and a half to six foot tall at this period, um, up to maybe seven or eight feet maximum. Probably not much longer than that, uh, probably eight foot is about the maximum. Um, so let's say between six foot and eight foot was the typical length of a spear. And spears break down into those three types as mentioned, essentially heavier, longer thrusting spears that you could throw at a push if you needed to, specialized throwing spears, so types of javelin, and one type of those that seems to possibly survive into the Viking Age is the so-called angon. Now the angon, I don't have an angon, but what I do have here is a uh, Roman Pilum. And the Roman pilum is sort of the ancestor of the angon. So the angon has a long thin shaft that is designed, as I have uh, demonstrated in numerous videos, to pass through a shield and hit the person behind. So even if you were holding this shield out at length out here, as you see the missile, assuming you do see the missile coming in towards you, and of course most things you're hit by you don't see coming, uh, but assuming you see someone lob an angon at you and you put your uh, shield up here to protect, there is a chance that that shaft will come through the shield and hit you behind anyway. Um, so a very effective weapon and clearly specialised to throwing. Um, not particularly good as a hand weapon, although you could use it as a hand weapon at a push. And certainly in the Roman era, we do have uh, at least one written example of pilums being used, or pili rather, being used as um, hand weapons as well as throwing weapons. And then lastly, there's this hewing spear. So what's a hewing spear? Well, those of you regular viewers uh, to my channel will know that one lives behind me, uh, leaning up against my door here. And this is essentially what hewing spears at the time were like. Now, these weren't specifically Viking weapons. These were a type of spear that probably originated in Frankish, uh, in, in the Frankish Empire, um, in my opinion. As far as I'm aware, the earliest examples that I have seen of these have actually been from, um, from, from the Frankish Empire, so or the Frankish Kingdoms. So, maybe even Merovingian, um, but this is a type of spear that is clearly quite different from the normal stabbing spear. The simple fact with spears is that the bigger you make the head, 
sometimes the worse they function as a spear if it's a conventional thrusting spear. So everyone thinks, oh, a nice big long spearhead looks great, uh, but once you start to use it, you find that actually having a light, quick spearhead that makes exactly the same hole at the stabbing end is actually uh, better if it's lighter. You can handle the spear more quickly, you can handle it for longer. It doesn't matter how strong you are, however strong you are, you will be able to use that spear more effectively and for longer if it's lighter. Um, but if you're gonna add extra mass onto a spear, you really wanna have a good payback, okay? For all of that added mass and therefore making the, the pole weapon slower, what are you gonna get back? Well, what you get with this kind of weapon is firstly something that can't be chopped off near the head, okay, because you've got more metal, so it's more difficult for someone who's uh, waving a sword around near you to lop off the head of your, um, or damage the shaft of your spear because the shaft is further away from them. But also, you've got these lugs. Now, these lugs are very, very important for a number of things. I've talked about these in previous videos. But I think the two most important purposes for these lugs are number one, defense, and number two, offense. Now that seems simple, simplistic, but it's basically true. For defense, if someone, for example, swings a sword at you, at your head, it means that if you're pushing, deflecting aside that blow, if it slides down the shaft, it will get stuck on that, much like the cross guard on a, um, on a uh, sword. But additionally, if someone's thrusting a spear at you like this, as we see with the later 16th and 17th century treatises which talk about pole arms, uh, for the partisan, um, these can actually be used to push aside the incoming thrust. So if someone else has got a spear and is thrusting it at you, you can actually use these lugs to control and deflect their thrust. So that's the uh, kind of defense. In terms of offense, you might think, well, what's, what are you gonna do with that offensively? Aha, that's when these come in. If the opponent has a shield, you now have the ability to hook, okay? So really, really useful. If you're using a stabbing weapon against someone with a shield, getting past that shield is somewhat problematic. But if you miss or they deflect your thrust and you can get over the edge of their shield and pull it, you can now come in with another thrust somewhere else. Lastly, the obvious thing to the hewing spear is that it can hew. And hew simply means a cut, okay? It could be a chop, it could be a slice. And if you've got this length of edge on your weapon, you now have the ability to deliver a fairly powerful chop, pretty much like a sword chop. Okay, or if you miss your thrust, you could come back with a pull cut. You could do a draw cut to the back of the knee, the hamstring, this kind of thing. Or you can do a push cut as well if the thrust miss, misses, then you've got a fair amount of edge up here that you will do a push cut with as well. So, quite versatile weapons. These probably were not primarily designed to be used with shields, or possibly they were, we don't really know. Um, if we look in Frankish manuscripts of the 10th, 11th century, um, then indeed we do see what seem to be winged spears, as these are sometimes called. We see winged spears used with shields, but I have to say in the Frankish manuscripts, they don't usually show a very long blade like this. So my interpretation, and feel free to comment on this below if you've got a differing one, but my interpretation is if you have a particularly long blade, then that weapon's not designed to be used with a shield. It's designed primarily to be used two-handed, okay? So it's a little, a bit of an exception to the normal spear rule of this period. Now we get into a weapon which is heavily associated with the Vikings and with the Viking Age, and that is the axe. Um, and it's so much associated uh, with Vikings, and correctly so, it has to be said, and I'll get into that in a second, that uh, even if we look into high fantasy, um, th you know, things like Lord of the Rings, where dwarves and the styling of dwarves in fantasy, or even Warhammer, very clearly owes a lot to the fantasy idea of Vikings, uh, the, you know, the horned helmet type of fantasy Vikings, they are given axes because of that association with that kind of stylistic culture. So axes are deeply, deeply... Um, uh, ingrained in people's imagination when they think of uh, Vikings. Now, funnily enough, it's one of those things which is, is almost a fantasy trope uh, that is drawn from history that is actually not really wrong. Uh, now, that's not to say that the Vikings used uh, axes, you know, like, like they were omnipresent. The fact is that probably spears and swords were 
I won't say as common, but the, uh, certainly spears were more common. Spears were probably the most common Viking weapon. Um, but swords were still very common. It wasn't like every Viking had an axe, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. But when we compare, and this is the important bit, when we compare to other European areas and other um, nations, if you want to call them that at, that, at this time, if you look at the Frankish Empire, if you look at Anglo-Saxon England, the fact is that the axe seems to have been very, very much more common as a weapon in Scandinavia than it was in the rest of Europe at that time. And it was the, it was the popularity of the axe amongst the Scandinavians that seems to have brought the axe as a mainstream weapon into the rest of Europe. Certainly in England that's the case. Such that, and I'll talk about the different types of axes in a second, but such that if you look at the Bayer Tapestry, you can see lots of English warriors using these, often known as Dane axes. Why are they called Dane axes? Because the Danes were Vikings. Uh, and in fact in England, the word Viking is not used very much in historical sources. They usually refer to them as Danes, even when they're not Danish, even when they're Norwegian, they call them Danes. So Dane is almost synonymous with Viking in um, Anglo-Saxon sources. But in the um, Bayer Tapestry, you can see Harold's, um, Harold Godwinson's um, house cars using these big two-handed axes. And why is that? It's because they're Viking axes. These are great axes, they should be more correctly known as. These are a type of axe that literally came from Scandinavia under um, uh, Canute and his sons, and this was this was a type of import from the, the bodyguards to Scandinavian rulers. So this is a type of large, noble, or kind of high status guards weapon that was carried in Scandinavia, brought to England, and became entrenched in English culture. And it should be pointed out as well, Harold Godwinson, although he's often touted as the last English Anglo-Saxon king of England, he was half Danish himself. He was half Scandinavian himself. So uh, the fact is that by this point in history, by the middle of the 11th century, the English and the the countries that Vikings came from, the Scandinavians, had so melded into one melting pot that even their weapons were basically um, the same at this point. So, um, axes absolutely were intrinsic to Scandinavian warriors, uh, very, very common, so common that it bled over into other European countries and their use of axes influenced other people's use of axes. Now, what type of axes did the Vikings use? Well, firstly, I want to say that uh, movies, TV, video games are very, very very guilty of equipping these fantasy Vikings, often with horned helmets or winged helmets or whatever, with types of weapon that they never had. And I'll get onto that at the end of the video more explicitly. But they often give them types of axes they never ever had. And I think the most common type is to either have a complete fantasy axe or to have a type of axe which we find in later medieval Europe. Um, so, you know, I, I've got axes, I've got various axes in my collection, which you guys on my, on my channel have seen, that simply a Viking never ever would have had. So what types of axe did they have? Well, first of all, um, one of the more difficult things with archaeology is discerning uh, what an axe, whether an axe was a weapon or whether it was a tool or whether it was both. Uh, and so archaeologically, when we find axes um, from Scandinavia, some of them are simply just boat building tools or wood felling axes. They are not all weapons. And I think some axes, possibly even some in archaeological reports, have been described as weapons that probably weren't weapons. Um, woodworking axes in particular uh, can look like bearded axes when you see a picture of them. But when you see the woodworking axe in real life, you can see that it's a woodworking axe and not a fighting axe. But anyway, again, topic for another video. Um, so first off, the Vikings had various types of um, simple flared uh, blade like this. Now, if you want to know the types, if you want to know typologies and a little bit more detail about this, again, look up Peterson's um, typology. So Peterson has a sword typology and an axe typology. But if you look up Viking axe typology on Google, you'll find lots of information about it. 
So they had simple flared heads like this, a bit like a later tomahawk. And in fact, to be honest, a lot like a lot of axes from all over the world. There are certain Indian axes uh, that look like this. There are 13th, 14th century European axes which look like this. And as I said, there are boarding axes and tomahawks which look a bit like this as well. So that's a fairly generic flared head. Now, the next uh, common type, and you'll notice these are both one-handed axes, is a bearded axe. So a bearded axe usually has a beard sticking out at the bottom like a big chin down there or a beard. Um, and these come in various shapes uh, but they they have this particular characteristic shape now the thing I want you to focus on because this is an overview video is notice these are both one-handed axes they are not particularly big okay in um, movies and film and uh, video games especially axes are often made far more massive than ever would have been practical because they would have been too heavy why you know why have a, why have a 10 pound axe that you can move really really slowly when you could have a, a three pound axe that you can move really really quickly okay you're going to do more damage with the three pound axe moving it quickly than moving a large 10 pound axe slowly now these aren't particularly large therefore but they're large enough remember again these are intended to be used with shields so if you're fighting with a shield uh, the axe offers lots of hooking potential and striking around the edge uh, of uh, someone's shield potential so there's lots of things you can do with the axe you can't necessarily do with the sword it doesn't have as great reach as the sword usually you could make the shaft longer because but then it would be more unwieldy um, but it doesn't usually have as much reach as a sword it can't thrust as well as a sword although you can just about thrust with it um, but it has more uh, impact damage and it has hooking abilities and it's more likely to destroy an opponent's shield as well just like in Bannerlord um, but these one-handed axes, uh, you know, that's really what I want to say about them. They're not massive. And they were the predominant type of axe. Two-handed axes basically could come, they could have blades of various forms that scaled up uh, that the one-handed axe could come in. Um, but this is the most famous style of axe that uh, really became what most people know today as the Dane axe. And as I've pointed out, again, if you want to fi find out more detail about these axes, watch my videos about house carls and about the Dane axe. Just search in my video um, and look in my Viking playlist. Um, but the important thing to mention about these is they are much, much bigger, but to keep them light, they are very thin. Okay, so they made the blades very, very thin. They've got a reinforced edge, so you've got mass where you need it. But the main body of the blade is very, very thin so that it's still a light and relatively quick weapon that you can move around where you need to fairly quickly without too much effort at all, but with a huge amount more leverage and reach, a colossal amount of reach actually, um, almost as much as a short spear. Um, so, axes, very popular in Scandinavia, that bled over into the rest of Europe. There aren't a huge variety of types, but look at Peterson's axe typology if you want to find out more detail about that. Most axes were one-handed, some great axes as they were called were two-handed, and they could come, they could also occasionally come with the bearded um, style of head as well. Oh, and the other important thing to mention is, these are simple axes with a socket and a blade. You don't really find axes which have things like a hammer or a spike on the back in the Viking period in Scandinavia. You do find some axes like that in other parts of the world, but not in Scandinavia, in fact, not really in Northern Europe uh, at all. Um, possibly in the Byzantine Empire, you did uh, get some with things on the back, but, and so therefore maybe the Varangian Guard maybe used more fancy types of axes, but Vikings, the Scandinavians weren't using those type of axes. They were using simple axes with an axe blade and a socket on a wooden shaft. Now, another type of weapon that was very, very important at the time, but which doesn't get a lot of attention when we're talking about the Viking period or Viking warriors. Um, I'm not going to talk about it at huge length because it's a fairly straightforward one, is the bow. Okay. Now, um, some people have suggested that um, short bows were in use during this period. I think based partly on looking at the Bayer Tapestry, uh, where the bows are shown quite small, but the archers are shown quite small as well. I don't think they're suggesting that the, that the humans using bows were smaller. Um, 
But the fact is that archaeologically speaking, we have some bows from Scandinavia. In fact, we have bows going all the way back to the Bronze Age um, from bog finds. And the simple fact is that they are longbows. They are simple self longbows. And they're functionally, although they're a little bit different in cross section uh, to later English like Mary Rose uh, war bows, the fact is that they're fundamentally, they are simple selfwood longbows, uh, pretty similar to later medieval bows. And it seems like the draw weights weren't particularly lighter, although there's always there's always argument about draw weights because it's a very difficult thing to guess when you're talking about a piece of wood that's very old because two bits of wood can look the same but have completely different draw weights. Um, but the simple fact is that the uh, Vikings did use bows and they are occasionally mentioned in the sagas. They are occasionally shown in art. Um, and uh, they, they definitely did use bows, but we don't know a huge amount about how the Vikings used bows. Uh, but our assumption is that the bows that they did use when they did use bows were predominantly um, uh, simple self wood bows. Now I should also mention at this point, so something I've skirted around on this topic so far, although I'll mention it a little bit more in a second, is the fact that when we're talking about Vikings there are also Eastern Vikings. Not Eastern Vikings, but Eastern Vikings, that is uh, people who were in, out in Russia and the Baltic states who were influenced by the weapons and culture and language and everything else of the areas that they moved to. And equally you could say that of the Vikings who ended up down working for the Byzantines as well. So uh, certainly in some areas it's possible that um, some Vikings were using <coughs> forms of composite bow and recurve bow but, but certainly within Scandinavia and Northern Europe where the Vikings came from and where they were mostly operating, simple wood bows uh, were the order of the day. Um, right, so the final weapon that I'm going to talk about, and I've left it till last. Now, <clears throat> this is a weapon which actually gets quite a lot of attention in terms of when people buy Viking weapons, most of which aren't very accurate to actual Viking weapons, incidentally. There's a lot of people selling Viking weapons that are just not at all like the original Viking weapons. But one of those things is the sax. Okay, now this doesn't have a hilt on it. Yes, this is the blade that I talked about hilting years ago that I did put a hilt on but wasn't happy with it, pulled it off and so it still doesn't have a hilt. But this is a pattern welded, broken back, uh, this is called style, um, sax blade. Now, a lot of people refer to the Viking sax. Now, this irks me slightly because I think a lot of people are under the impression that the sax is a Viking weapon. Well, it's not to say that the Vikings didn't use the sax. They did have the sax. They did have forms of sax. But the simple fact is that the sax had been around for hundreds of years before the uh, Vikings were ever a thing. Okay, so the the sax has its origins way back at the end of the fall of the Roman Empire period, the migration era, early 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 medieval period, way back at the time that the uh, Germanic tribes were moving all around Europe. The Franks were moving into what's now France and Germany, and uh, the Longobards were moving into Italy. The Visigoths were moving to Spain and elsewhere, and the um, and the Saxons and Angles and Jutes were moving to what's now England. So the simple fact is that this is a weapon which has much, much older roots than the Vikings. But yes, indeed, in the Viking Age there were still forms and they don't all look like this uh, and they mostly look very different to the recreations. So the common recreations of the sacks that you see have pa a parallel all the way up here and then they just cut off the point at an angle. There are no original saxes that really look like that. Um, and there are some very good places on the internet that you can learn more about the sax in Anglo-Saxon England or um, uh, Francia or in uh, Scandinavia. And there were different styles in different places. It evolved over time, uh, different blade types, and they varied quite a lot in size and in shape. So the simple fact is there isn't one type of Viking sax and the sax isn't just a Viking weapon. It's a type of knife that was all over Northern Europe at the time. Okay. Now, were these used in war? Well, that's the other thing. Okay. So you often see, if you read uh, Bernard Cornwell books, for example, you'll often get the impression that the sax was as important a weapon as the sword. And the simple fact is that I think that the both the text evidence and to some degree the archaeological evidence, but um, also the artistic evidence suggests that no that wasn't the case. The simple fact is that most warriors at this time don't seem to have had the sax as a major weapon and it's not often actually shown in art. 
occasionally it's shown in art and occasionally it's seen being used as a weapon but very often when you see people in art wearing a sax they're out hunting or they're traveling or you know they're doing something else they're not in war in war they've got the spear and the sword and maybe the axe um, so to me I think there's a fair amount of evidence that the sax was something like a bowie knife okay it was a carry around self-defense uh, knife that you could use in hunting, you could use in all sorts of crafts um, and, and everyday activities. And yes, it's a knife, so you could stab people with it and you could take it to war, but it wasn't, I think, predominantly a weapon of war. I think it was predominantly a, um, a sidearm of, of civilian life. Um, but that's not to say that the Vikings didn't use the sax. The Vikings did use the sax, but so did everyone else in Europe at that time. So as promised, I said I would finish off with some weapons that the Vikings didn't use. Um, now, why am I doing this? Well, quite simply because Vikings are so, so poorly represented in terms of their weapons and equipment. Even in the show Vikings, they're poorly represented. I mean, this is a show which is called Vikings, about Vikings, and they couldn't even get their weapons and equipment right. Although I have to say, they got some things right. The shields look kind of right, even though they're made of foam and you can see them bend. The axes, some of them are okay. The swords, some of them are okay, but there's a lot of terrible, I mean, the armor is absolutely awful in Vikings. Um, and the costumes are mostly complete fantasy. Um, but the fact is it gets even worse if we look at things like video games as well. So. Um, you know, various video games which, has dealt, which have dealt with Vikings have just gone for the most Thor fantasy kind of, um, you know, full Marvel um, idea of armour and equipment that they've given these, the, these poor guys. So the idea of these massive beards, the horned helmets and the double-headed axe. And that's the first weapon that I want to put on my list of stop giving it to fantasy Vikings in games or TV shows or whatever. Double-headed axes. Now... Is it impossible that they ever existed? No, okay, I'm gonna concede. It is possible that some Viking at some point in the eighth to 11th century said, you know what, I really, I really like Bjorn's ax, but I wanna have one with two heads on it. Uh, my good friend Tord, who made this um, ax actually has made a double-headed um, Dane ax like your great ax like this. And uh, you know, kudos for him to, to him for making it. And it looks huge fun and I'd love to have a go with it. Absolutely. But is there any evidence, any evidence of any sort, even a tiny fragment of evidence that a Viking had a double-headed ax? No. Okay, I mean, I'm not 100% certain in what, when I say no. I'm about 99.7% certain. So I do have a 0.3% um, of uncertainty there. If you know of any evidence whatsoever of a double-headed, uh, double-bitted axe in the Viking era from sort of the Viking sphere, then by all means post the, post the example below and, you know, show me it. Show me! Um, but no, I think no, no. Now no. the next weapon that really gets my goat, uh, that they often kind of really jam in there into some Viking era um, movie, is a sword which you can grip with two hands. And I, I know that since about, I think probably since Conan the Barbarian came out in the 80s, so many movies and TV shows as well want to have a two-handed grip for their actor. They don't want to think about the fact that shields were being uh, held with the left hand most of the time because shields get in the way of the cameras, they hide your very expensive actor's face some of the time. The stage choreographers don't really know what to do with shields because they've been to stage fight school and they learn what to do with a rapier and a sabre and a quarter staff, they don't know what to do with a shield because they don't cover that. Uh, so there are all sorts of reasons why they want to give actors a two-handed weapon. And, you know, frankly, nerds who want to buy ball hanger swords and wave them around at home, they're happier with a two-handed weapon because it's easier to use. Any, any weakling can, can wave a sword around, even if it's a great big overweight stainless steel wall hanger, they can wave it around with two hands. Not so easy to do with one hand because that requires a bit more strength and training and coordination, especially if you're holding a shield in the other hand as well. Um, but the fact is that one-handed swords were absolutely universal um, in the Viking Age in Northwest Europe. It's as simple as that. Uh, and frankly, in most of the world. Uh, I won't say that there were no two-handed swords in the world at that time, because there actually were. 
There were two-handed swords obviously in Japan, in China, in Korea, um, in India as well. So there were two-handed swords in the Viking age, so we're talking about a thousand years ago, just over a thousand years ago. There were two-handed swords elsewhere in the world, but there weren't in Northwest Europe. Now again, can I say that one Viking at some point didn't go, you know what, oh, I really love Einar's sword, but imagine how cool it would be if I made the hilt longer so I could hold it with both my hands. No, it's, it's possible that Bjorn decided to do that and he loved Einar's sword and he got Einar's sword made with a longer hilt. But the fact is that we have no evidence for it, no evidence at all. Years ago, I did see a picture of an archaeologically found uh, Viking era sword from Scandinavia, which did seem to have an unusually long hilt. But when we actually found the statistics for the sword, what we found it was, was it was an unusually narrow blade with a, a correspondingly narrow guard and narrow pommel. So actually in the photograph, it looked like it might be a hand and a half sword, but actually it wasn't. It was just a bizarrely narrow one-handed sword. Um, so the proportion made it look like it was two-handed but it wasn't. So the fact is Vikings and two-handed swords are a big big no-no. Not to say it could never have happened, There's not, there was nothing stopping them putting a longer hilt on here, but we just have no evidence whatsoever of it ever happening. Okay the final three I'm going to hammer through quite quickly. They are maces, crossbows and complex pole arms. So uh, maces, in fact we have almost no evidence, we have a tiny bit of evidence um, for maces maces being used by Vikings. Now maces did come into Scandinavia just after the Viking Age, so in fact we do start to see the first examples of maces from the 11th, 12th century. Um, and this comes almost certainly from contact with the East, um, with the, the Rus Vikings, the East Eastern uh, Vikings, uh, bringing in mace designs probably from the Baltic states, from Slavic regions where maces were a thing. And absolutely in other parts of the world, and certainly other parts of Europe even, Maces did exist. You did find maces down in the Byzantine Empire. You do find maces in the Baltic states and in Slavic places as well and into Islamic uh, kingdoms also. So maces were a thing but it just seems that they just weren't a thing in Viking Scandinavia. Uh, they weren't really a thing in England or France or whatever until we get into the Norman era and in fact we actually see a mace on the Bayer Tapestry 1066 and of course you could argue that the Normans were uh, uh, were descendants of, of Vikings in part, uh, that is true. Um, although culturally they were very much also Frankish because they were fighting like Franks. But the Vikings themselves, is there any evidence of a Viking using a mace? Not in Europe, uh, or not, should we say, in Western Europe. Um, and not really until the very, very end of the Viking era. So for most of the Viking era, if we're talking about, you know, the invasions of uh, Francia or um, Normandy or England, no, Vikings weren't using maces. Next up, crossbows. So there has been some assertion and there is there are a couple of isolated, I would say, archaeological finds which look like nut, the nuts, uh, the mechanism parts from crossbows. We know that crossbows existed, okay? So they had crossbows in China, they had crossbows in the Byzantine Empire, crossbows existed in the Viking Age. But is there any evidence for Vikings using crossbows not that I've ever seen. I won't say that categorically no, but not that I've ever seen. And if you know of any um, evidence whatsoever from the 8th century to the 11th century for Scandinavians using crossbows, uh, then I'd welcome to see it, but I'm, I'm not aware of it. Uh, and really the sources for them being used um, during um, Hastings and during the Norman Conquest is a little bit sketchy as well. And that's really after the Viking Age anyway, or certainly right at the end of it. Um, and uh, finally, what did I have? Complex pole arms. Yes, there we go. So as I talked about, the winged spear really is the most complex pole arm at this time. So sometimes, again, in uh, TV or movies and uh, video games, you sometimes see Viking type uh, warriors equipped with something akin to a halberd um, uh, or, you know, a, a kind of like a bill or something like that. 
there's no real evidence for it. Now, there were agricultural tools which could potentially have been used as weapons, uh, but we just don't really have any evidence for complex pole arms beyond the winged spear or hewing spear being used at this time by Vikings. So I hope that was fun for you and interesting. Uh, give us a like and a subscribe and spread this video around. Um, I hope it's been useful for people out there to bring a lot of topics that I've discussed in different videos all together into one video. Uh, as a sort of big overview. As always, all of these individual topics really deserve multiple videos of their own. Some of them have been covered in previous videos of mine, and I'm sure I'll cover them again. Uh, and some of those I have yet to do. I have yet to do a, a, a big video on Viking axes, for example, which I will do. Um, I will be talking about even things like Thor's hammers, and I will be talking about uh, Viking swords in more detail soon as well. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I will see you again soon on Scholar Gladiator channel. Cheers folks! Thanks for watching, we've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks!